to come up here and speak. <laughs> Fantastic. Looking forward to it. Well, this, this morning we start a new, a new series called Cross My Heart. And if you've ever heard that phrase, cross my heart, or ever said that phrase, cross my heart, you know where I'm coming from. And usually it's followed up with, cross my heart, hope to die. And it's, it's this, this promise. It's this, what I'm saying, I mean. And I'm telling you the truth. And as I was putting together, thinking what would we have for this next series as we go through this Easter season, and I thought about cross my heart. I thought about our great God and the promises he's made to us. I thought about how when we had fallen in the garden and sin had been brought into this world and death and destruction, our God didn't just say enough of you, figure it out yourselves and leave us alone. But no, he sent his son, his son who willingly came here to live, to die and to rise again for us. A Holy Spirit that would still be here with us today. Our God's great promise to redeem his people, that Christ would come and live for us and die for us and rise again. He would take our place, this Christ. And so today we'll talk about the beginning of that earthly ministry as Christ was baptized. And in a couple weeks, when we continue on in this series, we'll, we'll go as Jesus has this entry in. And then we'll go into that Monday, Thursday service and then go to that time of celebration when Christ rises again. And all of it is this great promise from our God. And as I cross my heart, and I love the idea of cross my heart. And when I think of the cross, Christ didn't just say cross my heart and hope to die. It's cross my heart I've come to die. So that you and I could have life. This message today, the first message in this series, is no peace. And perhaps you've seen signs that are like that in churches and all over. That if you, if you know peace, if you know the Prince of Peace, if you know Christ, then you would have peace in your life. But apart from Christ, you would have no peace. So if you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord, then you're living in a world where there is no peace. And as the Lord prompts you today, I would urge you to receive the peace of Christ into your life so that you could know peace. Now, as I was putting this message together, listen, you all got in your mailboxes a, a little notice there. I've kind of gone over time here a little bit. <laughs> Uh, months ago, back in October, when Pastor Jeff had his surgery, and I said, I'll, I'll, I'll step in, and I'd love to preach. He said, how many weeks? I said, as many as possible is fine. I'll, I'll let you know if I'm going to burn out. And so week after week, the elders and everybody's been asking, how you doing? Are you doing okay? I'm doing fine. But at the same time, what most of you don't realize is that that at work over last summer, one of the owners, the owner who ran the day-to-day -day stuff along with me, wanted to go in a different direction, and he was kind of caught in between this. And, and I said, why don't you go, and I'll take it the rest of the way, the rest of the year. And so day in and day out, I'm running a company. And oh, by the way, there's a family. <laughs> and we're in teenage years, which are kind of busy right now. And in all of it, I don't want to just shortchange it. In all of it, I want to give my best. I want to give my best in the home. I want to give my best in the workplace. And I want to come here and give my best in the church. And so what my life used to be where I'd get up at 3 in the morning and have my walk and my quiet time with the Lord and get myself prepared for the day and then go to work and come home and spend time with the family was go, go, go the minute I got up. And it was seven days a week for months and months and months and months. And I thought, we'll just keep going, and we'll keep going. And guess what? I ran out of gas, folks. A couple weeks ago, I realized, whew, the energy's gone. And in that moment, I realized, listen, I have got to, I got to slow this up a little. And so last, that's what last weekend was about. Friday and Saturday was just taking some time, some time of solitude. I was going to go and have some time for myself on Friday night and then time for myself on Saturday and just be with the Lord and, and just breathe and just keep going. And here's what I did, though, church. Got in my car Friday night for my time alone with the Lord and I started planning. 
And I started fixing everything again. And I started figuring, how can I keep this plate spinning? And how can I keep this plate spinning? And how can I keep this plate spinning? And I'm trying to control it all again. Even in my break, I'm punching in like I'm going to work. I've got this weekend. I've got to figure this out. You see, the danger of all of that is with me fixing everything and keeping the plate spinning. It crowds out our great God. You see, if you're going to know peace, you got to know Christ. And I know the Lord. I know him well. I've known him for over 20 years. But at this time, I'm trying to do everything myself. And what's happening is I'm pushing him out. And it's got to be him. This morning, I want to turn to Matthew chapter 3. If you would turn with me in Matthew chapter 3. I'm going to talk about John baptizing Jesus. And before this, John is talking about repent. He tells everybody, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand and it's Christ is coming. And he talks about the one that's coming after him. He's not even worthy to hold his sandals. And if you'd start with me in verse 13, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. And John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. That promise I made, listen, this has to take place, John. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And now God's word has gone forth and it shall accomplish that for which he purposed on this day for this church, for these folks here, and those listening at home and for myself included. Church, do you agree on that? Say amen. 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 This message of no peace today, I've got three points to it. The first is the screen, and I'll explain that in a moment. The next is the Savior, and the last is the peace. When I think about a screen, when you think about a screen, I think about you open up your door, and there is a screen there. And the whole purpose of that screen is that you could look out, and if somebody's on the other side, you could see them, and they could see you, but they're not on the inside. But you could still communicate. And when I think about a screen and I think about those who go to church and I think about salvation, I think about those who hear about Jesus all of their life. They know him. They can see him on the other side of this screen, but they never open the door and never bring him inside. And I think about the believers who, who have Jesus on the inside but go through their life. And we've heard about it today, the stresses of life. We heard from Doug in his prayer, we heard Mike reading earlier today, and all of these stresses come up, and we start to try to put Jesus on the other side of that screen again, and I've got it, and I'm going to handle it, the screen. John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, and I think what I like about this passage most is that, that he understands who he is and his need for a Savior. He is so mixed up by this, this fact that Jesus is coming there and he's going to baptize Jesus. And he's like, no, it should be the other way around. He knows who Jesus is. When God's in your presence, you understand how magnificent and how mighty he is and just how short falling we are from his glory. And John has always known how great Christ is. If you go back... And you read in Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, somebody asked me this week if I could put the verses up. And I'd love to put the verses up. I'm just telling you, by week's end, they change a lot for me. So I'd mess things up in my PowerPoint presentations. But I'll try to talk slowly here. Luke chapter 1, verse 39 through 45. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to the town of, in Judah. 
And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. She's going to visit family. And here you have Elizabeth who's with child, who is with John the Baptist, and Mary who's with Jesus. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? There is a recognition of how great this Jesus is, and he's not even here yet. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. John sees Jesus, and he knows how magnificent he is, and he's thinking, shouldn't this be the other way around? I shouldn't be baptizing you. Shouldn't I be the one? And a very similar thing in Scripture, when you, when you see Jesus washing feet of the disciples, and he gets to Peter, and, and Peter has her same similar reaction about his feet being washed by Jesus, because Peter can look, and Peter can see that Jesus used those very hands to heal the blind. And he knew that Jesus used those very hands to, to heal the lame. He would see Jesus put those precious hands on those who were dead, and all of a sudden life was again. He would see Jesus take those hands, and when everybody else would run from the lepers, when everybody else would turn and go the opposite way, Jesus brought those hands closer, and he embraced those people in need and touched them, and they were healed. He saw Jesus take two loaves of bread and some fish and feed thousands of people. He saw Jesus' hands take water and turn it into wine. And now, Jesus, you're going to take those mighty hands, and you're going to wash my feet? He says, no. No. I can't let it be. They understand how great this God is and their need for him. In that moment, they could have let their pride take over. Peter could have said, look at, who's, look at what he's doing and tried to get some fans. John the Baptist baptizing people and they would repent and people are coming and coming. I know Jesus. I've known him since the womb I left and, 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 and listen, he knows me. He wants me to baptize him. And, and the crowds would have just kept coming. But no, they didn't let the pride get in the way. They, they, they understood how great this God is and their need for him. Then comes Saturday last week. It's got to be a little different than Friday because I went nowhere with Friday. We had a great conversation Saturday morning and uh, and I went out. Where I was going was over here in Munster. I want to walk the trail. I love the trail. I love walking the trail. I'm going to walk the trail, and then I'm going to maybe go eat. And then I'm going to walk the trail some more, and then I'm going to drive. And then I'm going to walk the trail, and we're just going to walk and walk and walk. And this whole time, I'm probably thinking in my mind that it's just going to be me again. And, I, and I'm, going to, I'm going to set this God outside of everything, and I'm going to fix everything. I'm going to plan everything. Except God speaks. And he speaks in the most peculiar ways sometimes. So I put on the radio. And our kids have a way of giving us music. And sometimes it's there because they want to share it with us. And sometimes it's there. And I think they're just testing us to see if we like it. And if we give the okay, then it's okay to listen to it. Now it backfires on them sometimes because we like the music better than them. And now this is our new favorite band, and this is our new favorite song, and now we've wrecked it, they can't enjoy it anymore. <laughs> and one such group is these two Christian men. It's a secular group, but they're Christians in this group, and they write about heartache, and they write about pain, and they write about depression, and they write about all of these things, and, and, and just to let people know you're not alone, and you're going through this, and how to walk through all of this together. And I put on the song, do you mind if I share some of the lyrics with you? Here's the lyrics. I don't know why I would go in front of you and hide my soul. Because you're the only one who knows it. You're the only one who knows it. And I will hide behind my pride. Don't know why I think I can lie. Because there's a screen on my chest. There's a screen on my chest. 
and I'm standing in front of you, I'm standing in front of you, and I'm trying to be so cool, everything together, trying to be so cool. And the song goes on, there's some people and I who've had a tough time just getting through this life. So excuse us as we, as we sing to the sky. We're broken, we're broken, we're broken people. It's time to let God in. It's not about me and I walk the trail. It's amazing. We dress up and we put on the suits and, and we come here and we try to look fancy and we do all this stuff. And yet they're on a, on a trail in my worst clothes, in my jeans, in, in a sweatshirt. You know, I wanted to wear them here today. It, God spoke to me. Don't hold anything back. Don't hide. I see it all. I want in that life. Listen, I believe God speaks to me so I can speak to you. Last time I preached here, I stood down here at the end of the service and I said, if you are here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and you are alone outside of this relationship with Jesus Christ, today is the day of your salvation. You can repent and believe on the Lord and you can meet me down here as that final song was pray, playing and I would pray with you. And then I went on to say, if you're here today and, and, and you've know the Lord Jesus Christ, but, but maybe you've wandered a little bit and you want to come back and, and you want to start in that covenant relationship again. You meet me down here and I'll pray with you. And so that the rest of us didn't feel left out, I said, if everything's going fantastic in that relationship and you just want to give praises to this God, meet me down here. In church, I stood alone. I hope it's because I didn't communicate it right. But I hope, church, that we're not too cool. That we're not standing in front of him acting like we have it all together. We're broken people. We need Jesus. John, Peter, they need Jesus. The Savior. This baptism of Jesus marked the beginning of his earthly ministry. And that ministry would take him all the way to the cross. And we'll study that in this next month ahead here. You, what you need to know if you're new to your faith is that Jesus is not sinful. He never had sin. He was tempted and tried in all ways, but never sins once. And it's proven there even in that passage as we, as we read it here in, in Matthew chapter 3, because as John would baptize people and they would come out of the water. They'd be busy talking and they'd be busy repenting and talking about all the things that they're coming from. And so there would be that time of conversation. But listen to what it says about Jesus. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, there was nothing to talk about. There's no sin. He's baptized and immediately comes up out of the water and it's time to start the ministry. It's time to start doing the things that he promised he'd come to do for you and I. Jesus' baptism shows that connection with those who are lost in need of a Savior. The whole reason he's here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for our sake he, God, made him Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, that this grand swap would take place at the cross. All of my sins, all of your sins would be thrust onto him, and the righteousness of God would get credited to you and I, so we no longer live in death, but we can live in life, and he dies on that cross to death that you and I should have died, and he rises again so that we may have life. Church, do you have a need for that? Are you standing in front of them still trying to seem so cool? Or are we hiding behind our pride? Do you long to keep the plate spinning in your life? Do you want to be the greatest at home? Do you want to be the greatest in the workplace? Do you want to be the greatest in church? Or would you like to just maybe be the least in the kingdom of heaven? to be the least 
I need a Savior. How about you, church? Munster Church needs Jesus. There's the screen. There's the Savior. Now let me tell you about the peace. The Spirit of God, it says, after Jesus was baptized and he comes up out of the water, the sky splits and down comes this Spirit of God like a dove. And it rests on Jesus. And it caused me to think of another time in Scripture where a dove brought peace. And you have to go all the way back to the Old Testament and back to Genesis chapter 8 and, and, and revisit that whole story of Noah who is told before there's even floods, before there's even great rainstorms, listen, Noah, God's telling you, you go build this ark, you go build this boat, and you get all of these animals on there, and you get your family on there, and everybody's on his case, and everybody thinks he's nuts, everybody thinks he's insane, and then God sends all the water, God sends the flood, and spares them. Genesis chapter 8, starting in verse 6, it says, At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven, a messenger. It went to and from until the waters were dried up from the earth, and then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot. Remember that. And she returned to him, to the ark. For the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days. And I like the number seven in scripture, this number of perfection and perhaps the right amount of days he would send the dove back out. In the right moment, Christ came. He waited seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf, so no one knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. And when that dove come back, that dove brought good news. And when we see that sky part and this dove descend on Jesus and Jesus would go forth with this ministry, good news is brought forth. And this olive, this olive tree is a symbol of fruitfulness, and, and the branch is a symbol of peace. And so where everything had been destroyed, where there had been great turmoil, there is now new life. There is now peace. We know that story, and we often read it to our kids, and there's great little coloring books and little action figures and play sets, and it sounds all nice. And they come back out of the ark, but church, don't you forget for a moment what it must have been like to be on that ark. Don't you forget for a moment that everybody that taunted him and everybody that was left behind when that door closed, he would never see him again. The turmoil and the heartache and the destruction that was around. Don't think for a second that he didn't know what was going on outside that ark. Don't think for a second he didn't feel the pain and the suffering. And that didn't wake him up each night. And the cries going out to him. Don't think for a second that everything is great. But in the turmoil, in all of the heartache, in all of the pain, here comes peace. As I was studying, Matthew Henry says this. Listen up. The dove is an emblem of a gracious soul, which finding no home in which to rest, no solid peace or satisfaction in this world, returns to Christ as to its ark. If you're here today, and there's turmoil all around there is peace. Just reach out and grab the peace that God has sent you through Jesus Christ. It is that same Holy Spirit that descended down from heaven upon Christ 
that prepared and led Christ for earthly ministry. It's that same Holy Spirit that led thousands at Pentecost to repent and be born again. It's that same Holy Spirit that filled the, the writers of Scripture so that every word would be God-breathed. It is that same Holy Spirit that has lived in all of the believers of all times. It is that same Holy Spirit who is hovering in this place today and He sees through the screen. He sees your heart. He has come to bring you peace, to bring peace to your weary hearts. Will you receive him today? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you want to receive peace. Maybe today it's the first time.